Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's Asian uh, Impact Webinar. My name is Daniel Surodharma. I'm a Senior Research Fellow at the Asian Development Bank Institute. Today's webinar will discuss what COVID-19 has showed us about Asia's health emergency preparedness and response. It will be an hour-long webinar. It will begin um, with a presentation by Arif Ramayandi, a principal economist at ADB's research department, on ADB's new report that was launched on the fourth anniversary of COVID-19 being declared a global pandemic, which was uh, March 11. Afterwards, we'll have a panel discussion featuring four distinguished panelists, which I will introduce later. So to make uh, things uh, go smoothly and quickly, Arif, uh, please, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Daniel. So thank you very much for a kind introduction. Uh, let me begin this uh, particular webinar with a short presentation which guide you over the newly produced report of ADB on what has COVID-19 taught us about Asia's health emergency preparedness and responses. The report is written by Miraj Mamun, myself, and Dennis Sorino from Asian Development Bank, as well as Daniel Surya Dharma from the Asian Development Bank Institute in Tokyo. The report also benefited from the leadership and supervision of Abdul Abiyad, the Director of the Macroeconomic Research Division at ADB. This report highlights the lessons learned from the pandemic to inform preparedness and responses to health emergencies. It systematically examines the elements of health emergency preparedness, highlights data limitations that constrain countries' ability to rapidly evaluate and adapt their policies during a pandemic. Also measure the cost effectiveness of both pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical interventions applied during the pandemic. The report itself is necessarily limited in scope as it focuses on key technical lessons from the recent pandemics, particularly on areas where institutions like ADB support could offer useful facilitation. While the analysis and lessons focus mostly on Asia and the Pacific, the recommendations from this report are useful for policymakers in other regions as well. The report begins with evaluating or discussing the enormous cost inflicted by COVID-19. The pandemic have caused significant loss of life and affected the economy. The left-hand side chart there you see, in the left-hand side chart there you see that by the end of January 2024, it has been recorded over 7 million cases of death um, related to COVID-19. And because of this, GDP has also dropped well below trend in 2020 and has not recovered back even by early 2023, by end of 2023, I mean. COVID-19 also imposed heavy toll on psychological well-being with a depressive symptom surge significantly during the first and second waves of COVID-19. Left-hand side chart again shows you that during the first wave of COVID, um, the depressive symptoms as proxied by Google search index data has spiked in around April of 2020, and then re-spiked again during the peak of Delta variant uh, waves in mid-2021. The report also suggests that depressive symptoms worsens with stricter non-pharmaceutical interventions as shown in the right-hand side diagram. COVID-19 has also resulted in the longest school closures in recent history. These school closures led to significant learning loss, which hurt future economic prospects by potentially lowering permanent income. The closures also aggravated pre-existing learning poverty and widened learning gaps across the region. Next, the reports cover the elements of health system preparedness. Health system were mostly unprepared for COVID-19 with availability of health system infrastructure varied across the region 
all were mostly under severe pressure during the peak of COVID-19 infections. Uh, the chart gives you an example. The right-hand side one basically uh, shows that during peak of COVID-19 infections, there were five critical patients fighting over single ICU beds in the region. Another key element, one of the key elements of health system preparedness is its efficiency. The report tried to compute technical efficiency scores of health system using pre-COVID-19 data and suggests that the level of health system efficiency tend to be higher in high income economies and lower in lower income economies. In Asia, highest average of uh, technical efficiency of the health system tend to be found in the South Asia. Shortage of healthcare workers compromise this health system efficiency. As you see in the diagrams, number of physicians per 10,000 population in Asia are mostly fall behind the average of high income economies. That is also the case for nurses and midwives. In both cases, high income economies in the region also falls behind the, high, the average high income economies globally. Search capacity is limited, but an effective primary health system can help serve non-critical patients. Some countries were able to address their health system limitations by relying on technology such as telemedicine and mobile-based contact tracing. Some repurposed their industrial oxygen for medical use, for example. Uh, combined with this telemedicine, effective primary health system can treat patients with mild symptoms. And on top of that, primary health systems improves health uh, population health, reduces comorbidity risk, and is also the first line of defense during health emergencies. So these two factors, ability to deal with surge capacity, as well as having an effective primary health system, would be part of the critical elements of health emergency preparedness. Next. Access to medical countermeasure is also a crucial part of emergency preparedness. Many countries do not have the manufacturing capacity or approval process in place for producing medical countermeasures such as surgical masks, oxygen, and other things during emergencies. The charts again give you an example. Vaccines distributed, distribution is distributed unequally across the globe with uh, the number of vaccines available per person in most of the countries in the region falls, be falls below high income economies average. Um, not only that the number of vaccinations fall below the high income economy average, but also the time required to procure those vaccines is also much longer than the average of high income economies. Uh, in the world. Health emergency preparedness then requires long-term financial investment. Unfortunately, we still see a large gap exist in the level and sources of health spending among ADB in developing member countries. The chart, the diagram below shows that most economies in the regions are uh, spending fall below than what is high income economies spending in terms of national health expense, nominal health expenditures in 2020. Next, the report highlights that data limitations would weaken the COVID-19 responses. Data are needed for ex-ante predictions and ex-post evaluations of policy, as well as for course corrections. Hence, better data infrastructure was associated with lower severity of the pandemic. There is a suggestive negative correlations between data readiness and cumulative COVID-19 deaths, as shown in the diagram. In many of ADB developing member countries, health-related data are either outdated or missing. Of 46 ADB developing member economies, 
Only between 20 to 30 economies provide official data on the number of health facilities or equipments. In many of these, the most recent data are more than a decade old, as you can see in the diagram on the left-hand side. Uh, hospital beds uh, per, per 100,000 population, for example, are mostly available up to 2013. And that's also the case for provincial hospitals and other uh, indicators. This rapidly evolving nature of COVID-19 combined with data deficiencies have significantly compromised the effectiveness of COVID-19 responses during the pandemic. And last, we go to what have we learned about COVID-19 responses. From the early responses, at least we learned that to buy time, many governments have implemented strict non-pharmaceutical interventions. To this extent, trust in scientists and government is a key determining factor of populations' adherence to these interventions. Better health system quality will lead to better management of the pandemic. As you can see in the diagrams on the left-hand side, economies with better health system uh, efficiency tends to have lower excess death during the course of the pandemic, as well as uh, um, getting better vaccination coverage. Last, data-driven decision-making is critical in formulating more effective responses to deal with such health emergency situations. In terms of cost effectiveness of policy response, in general, we found that pharmaceutical interventions were most cost effective than non-pharmaceutical ones. The cost implication of policy interventions vary across economies and depend on their specific factors. Uh, there is also some evidence suggesting that mixing policy interventions can provide more cost effective than can 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 be more cost effective than applying just individual measures. However, in terms of uh, delivering packages for policy measures, countries would also need to consider their ability, their financial ability to finance the package. Let me close my presentation by three main key policy takeaways. The lessons from COVID-19 pandemic have underscored the importance of prioritizing investments in healthcare infra infrastructure and preparedness. Policymakers are urged to conduct comprehensive evaluations and implement improvements, particularly in addressing surge capacity limitations and establish establishing robust stockpiling strategies for essential medical countermeasures. Second, strengthening data infrastructure harnessing available administrative data and putting supporting regulations for data sharing. These three aspects are a foundation that would allow researchers and government agencies access to more data, conduct more accurate analysis, and hence inform better policies and decisions. Last but not least, the pandemic needs to rely on flexibility, innovations, and collaborations uh, to deal with. These aspects requires an adequately funded healthcare system, well-equipped infrastructure, and motivated and skilled personnel. Successful implementation of pandemic response programs in the past was attributed to broad, broad partnerships, close coordination, flexibility, and risk-taking ability. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Back to you, Danny. Thanks very much, um, Arif. So uh, just to mention that um, the report, the link to the full report is um, in the chat uh, box. So you can uh, go ahead and uh, download and read the report um, after the webinar or, or during, up to you. So now we will um, move ahead uh, to the panel discussion. Um, I will introduce the four uh, panelists and then I'll start with giving them a couple of questions that they will address. And from there, uh, we will uh, move to the Q&A. And then we uh, continue until uh, we finish uh, at the hour. So we have uh, four uh, panelists, and I will uh, invite them to turn on their uh, camera. Uh, the first one is uh, Sonalini Ketrapal, who is a senior health specialist at ADB's sectors group. The second one is uh, Minaj Mahmoud, 
who is a senior economist at ADB's research department. The next one is Associate Professor Brian Kim uh, from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And last but not least, uh, Gina Samaan, who is the unit head for Pandemic Preparedness uh, Global Platforms in the Health Emergencies Program of the World Health Organization. So uh, thank you all uh, for coming um, as panelists to this event. So I will uh, ask uh, the first question, um, maybe uh, to Gina and, and Minaj to kick us off. So as we see from, from the report and also you know, from popular media and also our own experience, uh, some countries appear to be more prepared to deal with the pandemic uh, than others, um, both you know, during the beginning uh, stages and also when, when the Delta variant uh, hit. Uh, we can see very high variation in number of cases, for example, and, and mortality. So in your opinion, um, which countries appear to be more prepared uh, to deal with the pandemic? Do you have any you know, countries to spotlight? And what are the reasons for this higher preparedness? Um, and also after that, maybe you could also mention a couple of things about generalizable lessons that other countries uh, could take from this higher prepared uh, country. So Gina, let's start with you. Thank you, Daniel, and greetings, colleagues. It's wonderful to be with you and congratulating the ADB team on this excellent report. I think the report highlighted at the macro level the, the fact that if you spend more on health and your preparedness systems, you do well. And so let's look at this in a, in a less macro way. Let's look at it in some of the observations during the pandemic. And of course, it's hard to generalize because it's multidimensional. So let me pick a few that I observed in my role here during the response. First, countries that invested in their public health services and systems did well. Why? Critically, those who have quality systems, offer services, easy to reach for the population, are, are ready to provide services. So in other words, it's the routine, the attention to the routine that helped them surge and stretch their systems. I think another observation, who did well, is those with practice, those who paid attention, countries that paid attention to emergencies, exercising their systems, or otherwise, unfortunately, but truly having emergencies, who have systems that can manage the response, including decision-making, including multi-sectoral coordination, the ability to deploy. So having the attention and, and response um, readiness is, was really critical because it, it, it reduced the lag time of having to set up the relevant coordination bodies, the decision-making systems, because it's well-practiced. And I think the third piece that we learned is about trust in both science and public services. And so the what to do to protect your health at the individual, family, societal level, what do you do if you're advised to take actions such as mask wearing or um, having a vaccine? The trust in that service, the trust in who's advising you is really critical. And so that speaks to the community, its resilience, its trust in governance. And again, I would say those are three, three elements that really do impact um, whether a country did well. So if I can maybe summarize, Daniel, in terms of what do we take from that? I think countries should strengthen what they do in routine practice because that serves as the foundation. I think countries should be planning for that emergency contingency and practicing it so that it, you are ready and there's the muscle memory, good to go. And then thirdly, to work with strengthening the workforce, strengthening the trust with soci within society and civil society in particular, to be sure that we are ready to work together, co-develop and co-implement those interventions, because without uptake of them, we don't protect society. So I will stop there. Back to you, Daniel. Great. Um, thanks, Gina. Uh, Minaj, um, what do you think about uh, this question? Thank you very much, Daniel, and good afternoon, everybody in Manila. So if you look at uh, the Global Health Security Index perspective, that is, we can see that there are uh, several countries on the top 
in terms of their preparedness, like countries in North America, Europe, and also from Asia, Republic of Korea and Thailand, uh, they are listed on the top in terms of global health security index, where uh, the country's preparedness are uh, determined based on their compliance to international health regulations, their uh, prevention capacity, detection, response, and health systems, uh, those issues. So most capacity countries are ranked high. So in, in that context, we see some countries are on the top pre-pandemic, and also there has been uh, some uh, changes uh, during the pandemic plus and minus in terms of the global health security index that we also discussed in detail in the report. So, and also if we look at uh, the countries specifically focusing uh, in the region, the Republic of Korea, Thailand and Vietnam. So these countries uh, are also uh, initially managed the pandemic, uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic very well. And the reason that we can see that with these countries, as Gina has also mentioned, that uh, the early investment in primary and preventive health infrastructure uh, that help uh, and help uh, worker recruitment training and also a good uh, uh, pro progress in universal health coverage. So that has contributed to their preparedness. They have invested more in risk communications and community engagement issues. And we also seen that uh, higher uh, cell system efficiency has also been reflected as a better preparedness in terms of managing the pandemic that Arif has discussed and also the better data infrastructure that contributed to the preparedness because uh, to respond effectively with testing, uh, contact tracing, and our disease control. So if we want to summarize that, what lesson that we learned that, that can help uh, countries, uh, one important lesson is, of course, the countries uh, learn from their experience. Like in the Republic of Korea case, we see that the learning from the previous experience uh, the countries can better prepare. And also an approach that, uh, a kind of approach that health is uh, everybody's business. Like you, you take a whole of society approach that engaging all sectors uh, and all disciplines and all coordinations, coordinations uh, to build a resilient health system uh, is important lesson that uh, countries can follow. And of course, the robust primary health systems supported by universal health coverage and resource uh, effectively uh, managing the resources and uh, implementing the policies that uh, that are effective in 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 maintaining the managing the pandemic using effective risk communication measures to, to summarize these this could be the uh, generalizable lessons that uh, we can see research. Okay. Yep. Thanks a lot, Minaj. So I want to move on to, to another question and um, maybe bring in uh, uh, Brian and um, Sonalini as well, uh, and maybe Minaj. So I want to talk about the non-pharmaceutical interventions, you know, the mask mandates, the lockdowns, the school closures, and these things. I remember uh, we all experienced it. And I remember during the first, you know, few months, um, I was very afraid of going outside. You know, I didn't know how to wear a mask. I couldn't stand masks, for example. We also have to go to the supermarket because the food is running out and these things. So, uh, Brian, you've done um, research on evaluating the impact of these NPIs, as we call them. So, eventually, right now, in hindsight, which ones uh, proved to be cost effective, um, for example, and which were not? Were countries, you know, too conservative? Did they put uh, these NPIs for too long and for uh, too strict. Um, maybe you can, um, you know, comment on on that first. Right. Uh, to answer this question, we have to divide by divide the, period, the pandemic period by two, like before vaccination, before Omicron, and after vaccination and Omicron. Like before before vaccination, vaccination or uh, during time of the Delta virus. Uh, the disease burden is much higher than the time after vaccination introduction and Omicron, 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 uh, Omicron variants. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, so some some MPIs are more effective 
before like before or another another one is more effective the other like in the uh, in, in in the second half um so to answer my question let me uh, list up the all the npis like fast uh, face face mask social distancing quarantine isolation school closure travel restriction lockdown and contact tracing like like these are the typical examples of npis um like in the beginning of the pandemic, all, all of these are like this work because uh, disease burden is super high. Um, so it's totally understandable um, to introduce these string, like strong uh, MPIs in the beginning. But after that, we realized that what, what is more effective, what is not more effective. Um, what, is, what is always effective was a face mask, uh, like the psychological cost and uh, the actual cost of the intervention is minimal, smaller than other things, but uh, uh, and, uh, and the impact is large. Uh, there is a science paper uh, in Bangladesh to show the impact of face, face mask, uh, but even with even face mask, uh, older generation has much bigger impact than the younger generation. Younger generation, face mask, impact of face mask on mortality is tiny. Um, so, that, so usually speaking, face mask is the, is the more effective NPIs. Uh, and we, we can also, uh, we or there, and another one is the extreme case is always not effective is school closure. Like there's a bunch of evidences that school closure has zero impact, even negative impact on the infection itself. The reason is that the students uh, who do not go to the school after school closure, they actually indeed infect somewhere else, at home and with their, with, with their friends. So school closure has no impact or even negative impact uh, in terms of COVID-19 infection from the beginning. Uh, and uh, the, the disease burden for the young generation is low and the learning loss for, for after school closure is huge. So school closure is always bad and face mask is usually much better and all other, other things are in the middle. Um, and, uh, and another worst case is uh, like lockdown uh, after Omicron and vaccination. So the good example is Shanghai lockdown, um, and everybody think is, I mean, there's so many like, huge, huge um, uh, evidences that 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 doesn't help, and in the end, many like they gave up, um, but the economic cost is huge. So yeah, um, uh, I, I think I'm gonna stop here, and uh, if if I got the if I got the questions, then I can uh, provide more detailed information. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Brian. So, um, so Nalini, uh, you were focusing in uh, South Asia um, in your work. Um, so, what has been your observation about, um, you know, non-pharmaceutical interventions and uh, the experience of people um, with these uh, in in South Asia uh, during the pandemic? Maybe you could share a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. And let me again join Gina in congratulating the team for this excellent report, because I think it's very, very important to keep the dialogue going and keep this prioritized at the country level and among the stakeholders. So congratulations on that. Uh, in South Asia, I think South Asia saw uh, severe lockdowns initially as uh, a non-pharmaceutical measure. And one of the reasons was, yes, to break the transmission chains, but another reason for that was also because the health systems were not equipped to deal with a high number of caseloads. So, so it, it might not be the only solution to break transmission chains. As Brian also pointed out, the economic costs are very, very high for that. Now, we all know from experience that, you know, one is, what are the mitigation measures when you have a pandemic? One, you want to uh, break the transmission chains. You want to do case-based surveillance. Um, if you don't have those systems, then you consider lockdowns. You know, uh, The second is that uh, you want to be able to have a health system with isolation ward capacity to be able to uh, contain the virus at the facility level as well so that uh, you can at least separate the vulnerable people from those that are less vulnerable 
to again break the transmission chains. Now, a very important intervention that was also um, explored by um, uh, countries and rapidly ramped up uh, from the initial days to the later days of the pandemic was uh, screening at points of entry. That again is very critical in the initial days of the pandemic and when you're trying to contain it because most countries of the region, unfortunately, who hadn't been exposed to say SARS or large caseloads of avian influenza, didn't have those systems institutionalized. And now as we come out of the pandemic, uh, we do see that countries are in fact putting in the resources and the financing to strengthen their points of entry. Um, I think all these interventions are, uh, are very critical, especially as uh, Brian has already pointed out, mm. mask wearing. Um, but let me also point out in this discussion that when the virus initially broke out, there was so much debate on the transmission chain itself. How is it spreading the virus? You know, um, I read so many research papers on the uh, aerosols and how uh, large they had to be, what should be the suspension of them in air to be able to uh, contain and what are the distance levels you need to maintain. So this kind of research, I think, was equally important in designing those pharmaceutical uh, or non-pharmaceutical interventions, which started to come out only once we started to understand the virus better. And by the time I think we understood it a little better, it had mutated. So I think it's an ongoing effort which we need to understand for the future as well, that we cannot have all the answers, but we need to have the capacities in place that can be mobilized uh, for rapid um, answer seeking or for the research to guide those kinds of non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, yes, and then finally, I would also like to add that there were several countries outside of masks that didn't adopt lockdowns. Now, pandemic situations and, you know, in human history, we see pandemics have been um, always there. And, you know, we have seen epidemics here and there which haven't taken the pandemic potential over time. Uh, what we need to understand is that over time, the population level immunity has to develop. And lockdowns are not necessarily the solution for that. It can either be through vaccines or through um, some form of exposures. Or So once the population immunity hasn't developed, then it's very difficult to contain a novel virus. And I think what has happened with COVID over time is that vaccines weren't really um, playing a role in limiting the transmission of the virus at all. They were playing a role in reducing the severity of the disease hospitalization and thereafter mortality. So over time, the population itself has started to develop a certain amount of immunity, which I think we also need to bring into the dialogue. Let me end with that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sonali. Minaj, do you have anything to add before we move to the next one? Thanks, Daniel. Uh, as Brian just said, uh, the, the timing of the adoption of these N NPIs and, and the country context uh, matter about their effectiveness. So. Uh, it's difficult to identify a single non-pharmaceutical measures that has been effective because uh, in most cases countries used a policy a mix of uh, mix of those measures. Uh, so in combination of measures. So if you look into the early P vaccine uh, NPIs like social distancing and mobility restrictions became effective in containing the virus or transmission, but uh, they appeared costly in terms of economy, society, and also law, law education, loss, all, all these things. So, But if we look into the cost effectiveness also, uh, in terms of like comparing uh, uh, the cost of these interventions, uh, whether in terms of the cost, disability adjusted life is saved, uh, they are also, the, 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 these measures uh, are, uh, effective in some places, less effective in some places, and it, highly ineffective in some places. Like school closures appeared very less effective, cost less cost effective and highly cost ineffective in some cases. Uh, and mask wearing or mobility restrictions, mask wearing are relatively less cost effective for low income countries because of pre-mask distribution over a long period of time appeared very costly. Uh, 
and mobility restrictions tend to be more cost effective in case of economies with higher population density. So there are, and this comes from our uh, analysis that we, we do some simulation exercise to understand uh, the cost effectiveness of these measures. So we see that mixing policy uh, interventions and PIs probably is, uh, appear to be more cost effective than of course applying them uh, individually and no one actually did that. So as uh, the countries need to consider their readiness and affordability of course, when, when uh, designing some uh, NPIs and policy measures, like one effective, uh, uh, NPIs probably, which it does not require highly strict enforcement, non-binding, like effective risk communications, messaging, like trust issue that uh, Gina has highlighted uh, in terms of public uh, measures uh, containing the virus. So effective risk communication, it, it can, can, you can probably identify uh, as an NPI that everybody should have in their uh, basket to begin with. And of course, uh, depending on the context, ability, uh, readiness, the countries will, of course, devise their uh, non-pharmaceutical measures. And also uh, vaccine, as Sonalini has said, that vaccine helped transmission of disease or severity of disease. And we see that that vaccine appeared to be highly cost-effective in all cases uh, in terms of cost per daily saved. Thank okay. you. Great, thanks, Minaj. It's a good good segue to uh, the next question I have. You know, moving from NPIs, we now uh, want to talk about uh, vaccines uh, in general. So, there. Yeah, so as um, Arif uh, showed, there are um, two problems with vaccines, right? Uh, the high income countries will were able to procure um, enough vaccines to vaccinate their population ten times over, for example while the low-income countries um, only had enough to maybe vaccinate everybody once or twice. Um, and we know that these uh, doses are supposed to be taken maybe uh, twice, at least in uh, most vaccine types. So there's this uh, inequ inequality aspect um, in terms of access to vaccine. And the second aspect is, of course, the, the length of time it took countries to procure them. So in some countries, um, high-income countries, it only took them maybe three to four months before the first uh, batch of vaccines arrived on their shores. But in other countries, low-income ones, it take them maybe a year or more than a year until they get their, their first batch. So um, maybe I wanna ask this uh, to Gina. Um, could you discuss sort of uh, the lessons that um, you think are important on this uh, vaccine uh, procurement, especially the equity aspect? And also maybe if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how developing countries, which, you know, cannot produce the vaccines themselves because they don't have the technical uh, resources, uh, can keep up in accessing uh, vaccines as well, or not, on, not keep up, but maybe uh, access them better in the future. Thank you, Daniel. And I've now had the experience of working in both the response to the influenza 2009 pandemic, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic. And let me tell you, we seem slow to learn this lesson, right, around access in real time uh, in, to have equity. So real time access when something is scarce has always been a challenge in these pandemics. So what, what can we do about this? What's happening now? at the World Health, Health Organization, it's a very busy couple of years. Why? Countries are negotiating an instrument. They're negotiating and working together to say, how do we set the policies for making it more equitable? So an intergovernmental negotiating body is considering a WHO convention, an agreement, or another, another form of, of instrument that can address these issues. And this is critical, working together, recognizing the inequities, a critical global step to uh, reduce the distance the, between the haves and have nots. I think that's really important to highlight. That's at the inter-country level. But let me bring this down to the country level. Who is at risk? Do you know who your, your at-risk groups are? Do you know if you have large migrant populations that don't access routine care? Do you know if you've got indigenous populations and where they are 
and the access to health services. With, with certain viruses, we generally know the pattern of who is at risk of severe illness. The very young and the very old, for example, were, were, were particularly affected during the last two pandemics. So what is the population distribution and what are the health services on offer to them? So what am I getting to there? Planning and using the data, the health administrative data, understanding the population dynamics in multi-generational homes, how do you protect the very young and the very old? So I think from those two perspectives, we have work underway where countries are negotiating how to make access more equitable, but in a country, we need to also plan and think about who is more vulnerable at a time of emergency and how will we target them? Now, if I can turn to an, a learning from the 2009 pandemic, which I'm hoping we learn from, and we, you are the Asia Development Bank, so let's think about the context for Asia. The 2009 pandemic saw the same effect of countries not having access to the influenza vaccine in time, inequitable access. And so after the pandemic, efforts were made in 16 countries to try to bolster production capacity of vaccines. So manufacturing capacity established. Now, was that successful? In some instances, 50% it was, the other 50% no. So now we've had the benefit of about 10 years of learning from that experience. What do we see? Putting in manufacturing capacity alone is not the solution. Having the factory alone is not the solution. Why? Because if you don't use it, it's not helpful. And you can't A, scale it up, repurpose it, have the supply chains, the, uh, the ingredients, uh, the ability to, to, to keep it warm. And so what it says really is, it's not just about the production facilities, but you need the policy environment and use of that capacity in the inter-pandemic period. And so that's critical because those 50% of the countries that established that capacity were the ones who said, you know what, we're gonna use it to pre pre produce influenza vaccine that we're gonna use routinely every year to protect our population against seasonal influenza. And if we can, we'll see if other countries would like to uh, procure it from us so we can export it. And we have the systems, the quality systems in place to make that happen. So it's not just about the production facility, it's about the policy and the use of these products in the inter-pandemic period. What do you, you gotta think about this from the get-go before anything hits the ground. How will you use it in routine time, in peace time, to keep it warm, uh, to set the policy, the operational mechanisms to make it useful to the population? Uh, because that's where it's going to really count. So I really hope that we learn this together um, and, and move forward from COVID with that in mind. Back to you. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Dina. So um, I want to go back to uh, Sonalini, actually, because uh, I know ADB uh, also supports uh, some countries in procuring vaccines. And um, if I remember correctly, some countries um, are trying to produce their own vaccines um, because you know, they thought it's too long to wait for the ones produced in Europe to come. Um, so could you say a little bit about the experience um, from the countries that you've been working with? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, I think one of the very important uh, lessons learned was the accelerated vaccine deployment. Usually the vaccine production cycle is 10 to 15 years. And we did see in the time of the pandemic, how systems were in fact streamlined um, and uh, the vaccines was produced in uh, roughly 12 months. I think there's a lesson to be learned there for the internal regulators. And this is something that is being re revisited as we are engaging with the post-pandemic dialogue support at the country level, where simplification of these processes is a very critical and priority agenda. Um, second, the regulatory capacities themselves need to improve. Uh, specifically in Asia, we know that um, India and Indonesia have 
a relatively higher regulatory capacity outside of the stringent regulatory authorities. And I think um, in, in ADB is actively supporting both these countries in meeting uh, the criteria that are outlined in the WHO Global Benchmarking Tool. And I think this would add and build on the regional capacity in case of any um, uh, future pandemics as well. I think um, another very important lesson during the pandemic was leveraging the private sector because most of this capacity was sitting um, at the private sector level and how government was able to build those pathways to be able to mobilize and protect the private producers to take on that additional risk. Uh, to produce volumes of vaccine with a pandemic that was still unfolding in front of us. I think that was a very critical step in uh, uh, public-private sort of engagement. And I think that has, in fact, laid the pathways to closer engagement uh, in the future as well. Another very important aspect from the pandemic was how um, the research and the production collaborated specifically in the case of AstraZeneca and Serum Institute of India. And together, they were able to leverage that their skills and their and strengths to produce over 2 billion vaccines, which were very, very critical um, during that time. Now, let me also touch a little bit uh, upon the elephant in the room, which is COVAX. You know, COVAX was a brilliant global initiative. It was a great idea. It really entailed uh, WHO, CEPI and uh, Gavi coming together uh, to procure deals or advanced agreements with pharmaceutical companies. Now, I think uh, COVAX was... Um, you know, it worked to a certain extent, but not with the expectation the world had placed on COVAX. And I think there are lessons to be learned there as well in terms of uh, how equity can be maintained in the future specifically. Now, one, it did uh, sh uh, fell short of funding in the initial days because um, there was a diversion of the initial commitments that had been made towards bilateral deals that were being struck. Two, there was also um, the production facilities themselves, you know, were able to pr maybe uh, strike more lucrative deals through these bilateral deals or the governments where these facilities were placed uh, restricted export of these vaccines, which is also a very important lesson because there was no strong legal instrument to be able to prevent that and national interest tended to prevail at that time. And one of the, you know, when we are designing instruments, especially around international collaboration, COVAX, for example, had allocated 20% blanket to all countries to protect the frontline workers and the vulnerable population. Now, the pandemic was moving at a different phase uh, and pace in different countries. And I think it's very important uh, lesson to be learned there because the needs at the country level might have varied. So um, as we, as Gina has already touched upon, and we as health specialists are really looking uh, towards WHO for this uh, pandemic treaty or um, convention or agreement that is currently being uh, debated and drafted and that is supposed to be tabled in the next World Health Assembly, because uh, the promise it holds is to have a legal agreement to be able to um, mandate some of the requirements at the country level uh, during times of emergency, which is very critical. Let me pass it back to you, Daniel. Thank you with that. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Sonali. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a lot uh, to think about, I guess. Uh, but now I wanna maybe move uh, to like a forward looking uh, question because um, I don't think anybody here uh, doubt that there will be another pandemic in the future, but there's a lot of uncertainty on the type of the pandemic? Is it going to be like uh, SARS and COVID or is it going to be something else? Um, and also the timing, you know, when that will uh, strike. Um, so with this uh, high uncertainty and on the, that's on one hand, on the other hand, there is a lot of um, financial constraints uh, among developing countries like uh, Arif uh, showed in his presentation that, you know, countries just can't afford uh, to build preparedness for everything. Um, so they should be prepared for some general things, but maybe not the specific things. And this is also 
some of the questions in the Q&A box about whether a country can be fully prepared or not. Um, so what kind of investments are, are necessary um, to increase uh, health emergency preparedness and how should countries think about financing these uh, considering this uncertainty. So I'm gonna uh, pass it on uh, to Brian because even though you're working in an economics department, I know that you're also a, a medical doctor. So you have this uh, two um, you know, expertise uh, in one. So please go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is super difficult question, right? What exactly, we, we, we don't know what exactly happened in the future. <laughs> so, uh... Like in the reported weeks, like um, Arif is explained the uh, the like future uh, future how to how we prepare the future pandemic very well. Um, my sense is my my idea is similar, and uh, um, I I also think the state state capacity for the emergency uh, emergency preparedness uh, is important. Uh, and my idea is that uh, general healthcare system is. Like that's number one, public health, public hospitals, universal health cares, real time data collection and analysis, and uh, like, uh, and the evidence-based policy. Like for example, like this time, uh, some countries have uh, have foundation to collect the data real time basis. Um, some countries do not. The country do not have any, like these kind of data, data uh, deficiency, they have zero they have very minimal idea how to address this. And even uh, if the country, even with this kind of system, their uh, real-time data, data collection system, uh, they kind of fail to introduce um, uh, the evidence-based policy. The, like, um, um, <laughs> like Korea also, uh, Minas mentioned that Korea is a good example, but the Korean people do not think uh, Korea, Korea, is, uh, Korea is really introducing the Introducing uh, evidence-based policy, uh, especially for the school closure, uh, and they um, and they still wear the mask. Can you believe it? Uh, like uh, wearing the mask at the hospital is still mandated in South Korea. So some countries are doing okay, but they not like all the policies is not evidence-based policy. And another stupid thing uh, that the Korean government, I'm I'm kind of kind of. Uh, uh, criticizing the Korean Korean government because I'm I'm a Korean. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Korean, one, one thing uh, one thing they want to do is to build up like huge hospital for infectious disease, like the 200, 200, more than two hundred bed only for the infectious disease. That's I don't think it is a good idea because uh, like when 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 the pandemic comes next and what like. If it is dedicated only for the infectious diseases, uh, this is basically empty, right? <laughs> empty in the most of the time. Um, so, so, um, so, like there is a fire bag uh, on this plan, uh, but like big donor, uh, there is a huge like Samsung actually. Samsung donated a lot of money to build the infectious disease hospital during the pandemic because they believe that all oh, this is like important, but then. After that, we think this is not reasonable, but since they already accept the money and they kind of commit commit to match up that match up uh, to the hospital, uh, they kind of going on. Um, and and I think this is one of the good example uh, which could be ineffective investment in the future. So uh, we should, my my general message is that not we have we do not have to focus too much on infectious infectious diseases but rather than we have to we have to focus on our like general muscles to fight against any type of enemies in the future thank you great so also you know related to this uh, because this is also our um, big um, theme of the report so Gina I was interested in your story about in 2009 about the influenza capacity do you know what happens to the 50% of countries that were successful in producing influenza vaccines and keeping them warm? How did they fare uh, during the COVID pandemic? Yeah, Maybe wonderful. just uh, very quickly, yeah. Sure, wonderful question, Daniel. Uh, what happens when you introduce something like an influenza vaccine every year, which targets health workers, the elderly population, 
it's not tar targeting the little kids who get have a routine schedule for immunization, right? So little kids go and get their schedule every every so often. They, there are centers dedicated to it. Do adults and health workers have similar facilities? No. So the countries realize that, great, we've got this vaccine. We know who we need to vaccinate. How do we make it happen? And so what those countries were able to do was to operationalize it, how to deliver it, how to engage those communities to say, you need to get it every year because this is what, how it will benefit you. So their risk communication came in, the ability to monitor its impact. So how do you look at adverse events? How do you monitor that and coverage? So what, that, what those success stories showed was you had capacity production secured, you could keep it going and the quality assurance of it year to year. You could then roll it out to your high risk groups, your target populations, and you can monitor it. And so come the next big event, as Brian is saying, don't prepare only for that big emergency. Think about the routine. They have the routine and they're, they're really practicing that. So then it surged. And during COVID, we saw that those countries that had the operational readiness because of the influenza systems they had established were faster at implementing COVID-19 vaccines. There is research that now shows this. So it's a system that was designed to target the, those groups, health workers, et cetera, emergency workers, that were benefited quickly because operationally the countries were ready for it. Back to you. Great, thanks, Gina. So I want to, uh, you know, spend maybe the last minute before we close uh, to give the floor to uh, Sonalini because you know you're the one working with countries um, to increase their preparedness. Uh, what what do you think should uh, countries uh, how how should they think about a general health emergency preparedness for the future, given all the yeah. uncertainties? No, I completely agree with the other panelists. In fact, on strengthening systems, which continues to be um, an agenda, which is one, very critical, and two, it's always going to be warm, you know, at the country level, because uh, even if, you know, like Gina had pointed out also that you can put in the production facilities, but countries didn't have the systems to deploy the vaccines. You didn't have the cold chain capacities. You didn't have the the planning that was in place, because once a while of vaccine was opened, for example, Covishield, it had 10 doses in it. You had to have the planning in place to be able to deploy it. And I think that's why health systems continue to be very important, especially primary health care for vaccine deployment, but also case-based surveillance. This is very, very important to break transmission uh, change, a uh, chain, sorry. And then leading from that, I also want to touch upon one very important element, which is on the digital transformation that is taking place at the country level. Uh, that is a very, very important important agenda that I see almost every country in the region picking up on because those systems brought in a level of efficiency in deployment. And also, uh, I think Brian touched on this earlier, that how quickly you can turn a real uh, uh, real data monitoring around is very, very critical for the future pandemics, but also for monitoring disease transmission for any infectious disease. And I I think those are sustainable systems that should be put in place at the country level, which are uh, very, very uh, critical and important. So since I only have one minute, let me end with that. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. So um, I will use the last minute to uh, thank uh, everybody, Arif, um, Sonalini, uh, Brian, Minaj, and Gina for spending the hour with us. Also to everyone uh, who stayed on. And before we close today's webinar, uh, we would like to invite you to join our next uh, Asian Impact Webinar, which will be on uh, Asian Development Policy Lecture by Karen uh, Grohn, who is from Brookings Institution, and she will talk about uh, women and labor market inequalities. This will be uh, on the 26th of March, uh, Tuesday, from 10 uh, a.m. Manila time and uh, through Zoom. So please do check out uh, the webinar uh, AIW page and also our chief economist's uh, X account used to be known as Twitter uh, for more updates. So that's it from us. Thank you very much and hope to see you again next time. Goodbye.